It's a robot. It's a race car. It's a building, a balloon, a mountaintop, a rocket ship lifting a child to the stars or lifting a music director to the stars out of the box. It's not simply the casing, this box, the holder of the gift, but the box is the gift itself, inviting wonder and imagination, a type of simplicity, a simple, not extravagant, not complicated invitation to create a world of joy in the common. This is a type of simplicity that isn't about diminishment. It isn't about a rejection of things and stuff necessarily. It's not about a rejection of the wider world or society or culture necessarily, but it is a rejection of the idea or the assumption that stuff and more items and things are necessary and good for a fulfilled life of meaning and purpose. This is a type of simplicity that opens up to more possibility, finding a whole sky filled with stars spilling right out of a cardboard box, trying to keep things simple, however. In a culture and a season of excess is not always the easiest thing. I don't know about you, but I'm starting to experience some of that now. The pressure to shop and to buy, the to produce and to create, to plug into the festivity machine that glitzes up century-old rituals spanning culture and traditions of candlelight and fire, of song and poetry, of humility and hope. The pressure to do and to make and to shop till you drop can be less than a jolly task. Now, I'm not one to dismiss festivity here donned in evergreen, and if you drive past my house, you'll see lights out front, maybe because of my family growing up or my natural own tendency towards celebration and feasting and festive gatherings, parties, music, good food, eat, drink, and be merry is my natural tendency and motto in life. But it would be too simple, really, to make such a dichotomy between the holiday season in our culture on one side and the spiritual religious call to simplicity on the other, as if it were that simple and as if they were that entirely separate. As if buying stuff is always bad and sitting in silence is always good. Festive music, no offense, is always bad. And ancient chants are always good. Parties and food and drink are always bad and isolation and quiet are always good. It's not quite that simple, is it? A tradition that has lived into a nuanced and deep practice of simplicity are the Quakers. So a Philadelphia meeting of Quakers many years ago wrote this about simplicity as a way of not diminishing or stripping away or rejecting all things worldly, but opening up to deeper meaning. They wrote, simplicity, when it removes encumbering details, it makes room for beauty and music and art in living. It clears the springs of life. It cleans the window of life and lets joy radiate through. It requires the avoidance of artificial and harmful social customs and conventions, but it opens wide the door to cultivate and express to all sincere cordiality and kindness and friendliness. This sort of simplicity, they write, removes barriers. It eases tensions and in its presence, all can be at ease. The Quakers in their strong tradition of not rejecting, but filtering the wider culture through values of justice and, and simplicity and spiritual well-being and equality, begin to find a balance that is needed in a frenzied world. They say it requires the avoidance of artificial and harmful social customs, not just social customs writ large as if they're all bad. In this season, perhaps the opposite of simplicity is a feeling of pressure or of tension, of closing in, of obligations and tasks, a feeling of constriction of the spirit that has real life consequences on one's health from financial strain, family strain, festive strain that begins to close in on a person. On a beautiful winter evening on the prairie, the snow began to fall lightly at first, but was growing thicker and thicker. The roadway became more and more obscured by the flakes that were, that were flying up on the windshield, illumined by the headlights like a white wall against the backdrop of a dark prairie sky. They were in an open prairie on a two-lane highway and couldn't believe how much the car just felt surrounded in white, surrounded and engulfed by the snow 
and they tried to see through. This was the 1960s when cars were built like tanks, pure metal, but a muscle car doesn't help much when it feels like you've been covered by a white sheet. How much farther was the next town, they thought, not paying attention to the odometer? Why can't we see any exits or any farm lights or any towns or any other cars at all? How long before a plow or anything comes along, they asked. So they decided to stop the car. My father and his friends could barely see a foot outside of the car in any direction. It was as if the world had ended because they couldn't see it anymore. So he sat up on the window and got his head above the roof of the car. He looked around and the swirl, now that the car had stopped moving, calmed a little bit, but it was still pretty flurry. He was squinting through the snow, spiraling around, and then he heard a sound that was faint at first, and it grew, and it grew, and vroom! Right above him, about 10 feet, he saw headlights vroom right across something that was up there. And he turned to his friends in the car and he said, well, I think I see the problem. He said, the highway is up there. <laughs> they had been driving in the ditch through the snow for miles. They're not sure how long. Somewhere along the way, they got off the road into the ditch, now filling with snow. And this ending of the world was just the snow hitting the roof and the hood, flying up from their muscle car, driving through the ditch. And so it took a little maneuvering. They pushed the car up the side of the ditch. They got onto the clear and now beautifully plowed road where the snow was still falling, but the road was much clearer. Just above their heads, just above the ditch, just above this place that was swirling with snow falling, the road was much clearer. This place where the path was made difficult by obscured senses, just above that was an opening. They had no idea it was there. They also wondered, what have the cars been doing that have been passing us and seeing us in the ditch, just plowing through, not helping us at all? Thought we were out for some joyride. But there, lost in the swirl of the ditch, trudging through as if it were the only way, was it not for their stopping or knowing somewhere deep down, ah, this isn't how it's supposed to be. They may not have stopped, at least not as early, to find that clear open sky just above their heads out of the encumbering details into the deep breaths of fresh air. It wasn't that the winter or the snow was not beautiful. They just got dragged too far down into it. So it was the only chaos that they could see. They needed to stop and to pause and to find a way back to simple, common, manageable paths. Sufi mystic poet Rumi writes, there comes a time when sea and land come to rest. There comes a time when even the heavens withdraw. There comes a time when weary travelers need rest from the journey. You know, you don't have to keep running. You don't have to keep going. You don't have to keep producing, keep buying, keep making, keep doing whatever it is you feel you have to do. Until in the words of some I've heard from you and I've heard from others, we become human doings instead of human beings. You don't have to keep fleeing the bear, assuming that you must flee and the bear must chase. You don't have to keep the capitalistic, consumeristic machine on your heels, pushing you along. You don't have to keep up with all the decorations and the hosting, the gifts and the parties, the frantic joy as if this is what made you a good friend, a good parent, a good coworker, a good citizen. You don't have to do it. And the hard part is, I think, we know that. Somewhere deep down, we know that, but it's hard not to get swept into the fray over and over again by things that aren't nourishing our spirits. This season, which can be so hard for so many reasons, so many people, from the pressure of measuring up to that crisis level orange of festivity, or the hard memories of loved ones gone, or complicated relationships or isolation by the wider culture because of religious or cultural difference, it can be easy to get trapped down in the ditch. It can be easy to feel surrounded by a swirl of isolation, trapped in a box that's just a box. Martha Postlewaite writes in her poem, Clearing, do not try to save the whole world or do anything grandiose. Instead, create a clearing in the dense forest of your life and wait there patiently until the song 
that is your life falls into your own cupped hands and you recognize and greet it, only then will you know how to give yourself to this world so worthy of rescue. The slowed down season makes room. It makes room and opens up space for beauty, a grace and spaciousness of openness and air and breath. It makes room in the heart, in the mind, in the body, in the soul for beauty and for music and for love, not to reject the beauty and the festivity of the season necessarily, but to dwell more deeply in the parts that nourish you to listen to the harmonies of the brass when they're playing, to relish in and soak in those things that give you life and nourishment, whatever it is for you, light, stories, gifts, wonder, music. Let it surround you. Filter out the distractions telling you what you must do to be happy, to be generous. Try in every way you know how to find and love and celebrate the moments that let you slow down and remember and feel what it is that opens your heart, what it is that makes more room for breathing and living outside of the box. Because it doesn't have to be a box. You don't have to travel in the ditch. There are ancient traditions that say, light some candles, sing some songs, read some poetry, gather and hold those you love. Find your way to plow that road, make a clearing, dream your way out of the box, hitch your soul to a rocket ship, to stars just above your head, where you can hear angels and singing and music and joy, and you find a Mindot plow going by. <laughs> Recently, I was sitting in a coffee shop with some friends, and I heard a young voice at the table next to us. It must have been a four-year-old voice or so, I think, a type of voice I'm particularly attuned to these days. You know, sitting with her family, squirming around on the chairs and up through the typical noise of public space, yelled as if proclaiming from a mountaintop filled with wonder and joy, this is a coffee shop. <laughs> so sometimes the still small voice isn't so still and small, it's loud and small, simply naming what is what is common, what is right there, something that at the moment was giving this little one great joy, whether it was the coffee shop itself or the fact that she knew what it was, whatever it was, I'm not sure, but it was like a clarion call, breaking through the regular noise, rising above the common hum of everyday life. She went to go tell it on the mountain that this was a coffee shop, and her voice just above our heads rang out crystal clear. Above all the bustle, a voice sounded calling our attention to the beauty and the place of now. Maybe with a little concentration or intention, maybe with a lot or a little help from others, from whatever source it comes from, something much larger than yourself or something very deep within, both of which can be sacred. Maybe something will call to you and invite you, ready and longing as you are, asking you, are you ready to slow down? Are you ready to create a clearing in the dense forest of your life? Are you ready to make a pause, make space for breath? Are you ready to notice the open road just above your head, out of the blizzard swirl and chaos that this season can quickly become when you are just a few feet over from where you know you ought to be? Maybe right at the moment when you're ready to receive it or not so ready to receive it, something will happen. Some voice in whatever form it happens will be waiting for you with breath and with silence and with stillness and with simple beauty. It will seem so simple with a sigh beyond words that maybe something somehow, some voice within or over your head will ask you, why have you been in this frantic frenzy of festivity? <clears throat> Why do you keep thinking to measure up, to keep up, is what you're called to do in this festive strain? Some voice, after you stop and pause and are ready for a different way to travel through a season, when you know you need to, maybe a voice will simply sit down, take a breath, write with you, and say, 